talk to me. WSRadio.com Welcome to Track Talk, your connection coast to coast and beyond in all the latest news, developments, stake race analysis, and interviews inside the world of thoroughbred horse racing. From California to New York, Florida, and Kentucky, we have you covered. It's post time, live from San Diego, it's Track Talk. And we welcome you on a Saturday morning live from San Diego. Welcome aboard WSRadio.com, the worldwide leader in Internet talk and on the road to the Kentucky Derby as uh, the calendar changes to February 1st. We get a little bit closer. Three big uh, stake races, actually four big stake races around the country that will have ramifications in regard to the Kentucky Derby. And uh, that begins back in New York oh, with the Withers. Shotsky, looking forward to see Shotsky run back. And then we go down to South Beach in Hellendale, Florida, Gulfstream, the Holy Bull. We'll see who lines up there. Uh, the Robert Lewis here uh, in California with Thousand Words. And then there's one more. And probably uh, uh, Larry Zapp will know that uh, when we get to him. But before that, let's bring in Tommy D inside the studio. And uh, Tommy D, a top of the morning to you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. As you said, Derby uh, prep trail right around the corner. Got a couple big races. The race you might have been talking about is the Swale. That's a grade three yeah. going seven furlongs down at Gulfstream. Uh, another race for three-year-old. Right. So big day uh, all around. Santa Anita's got a nice card, Aqueduct, Gulfstream. So there's a lot of good racing going on today. Uh, to take a look at. Let's go to Zapper up in Los Angeles at uh, Santa Nito, filling him in, uh, getting him connected on a Saturday morning. Uh, Super Bowl Eve. Well, it's not Eve because it's daytime, but it's uh, the precursor to the Super Bowl. Larry Zapp joining us from the great race place at Santa Anita. And Zapper, top of the morning, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing really good, Felix. Another beautiful morning here at Santa Anita. We've had some of the cleanest, skies and mountains right in front of you and you know Santa Anita's cut back a little on racing meaning about seven races a day during the week but racing's been very good here weather's been phenomenal and uh heard you guys talking triple crown trail I mean it'll be interesting uh today between Aqueduct Gulfstream and Santa Anita which is the Robert Lewis if we have anything uh you know if there's any horse or two that gets on uh you know, everybody's lit. It's that time of the year. We're still maybe a month out. I know Sam Davis will be coming up at Tampa in March and April. We'll really have the key prep. But nice to have uh, some of these young horses, inexperienced horses, seeing if any one of them can step up. Or we can go coast to coast looking for maybe a horse that can make us a few dollars today. But obviously looking for a horse that maybe gets on that triple crown trail. Yeah, without any question. And that's what they're vying for. The Sam Davis, as you mentioned, uh, Independence Hall, owned by our friends of this radio program and our very close friends, uh, Zapper, uh, Bob, and Kathleen Verratti, uh, shipping and already shipped to Tampa Bay. He'll run next Saturday in the Sam Davis, as you mentioned, at Tampa Bay. Uh, today, all around the country, connections trying to get in. Uh, t contention, uh, win a few points here and there as uh, we get underway with the preps. But when Tommy D said the swell, you know we're getting close to the Kentucky Derby uh, when the swell stakes precedes the Holy Bowl. And we have some great, great races today. Just one mention of Santa Anita, if I may. Uh, beginning next week, uh, they will go to a three-day race week something that this radio program has always been behind. When I did talk with Craig Fravel upon taking the job at Santa Anita, that's one of the first mentions that I shared with him, that four days wouldn't work at Santa Anita. Three days would be perfect. You understand that they're only giving us seven races a day, and on Thursday or Friday, whatever the case might be. And the reason for that is that there are no horses. A lot of exodus has been experienced at Santa Anita uh, with a lot of barns 
taking a group of horses, a string of horses, moving them to the Midwest, maybe to the fairgrounds or Oaklawn Park, wherever the case might be. There's a shortage here. So that equates to the seven days or the seven race days, uh, seven race day that we are experiencing. And I think that will uh, strengthen the whole Southern California game. As we look at all the action today across the country, where did you find the most value, Tommy D? Uh, I kind of like the San Anita card, but I thought the Withers at Aqueduct uh, looked like a pretty wide open race. Uh, you know, speaking of the that's at Aqueduct, that's a grade three uh, going a mile and an eighth. Um, the weather's supposed to be in the 30s all day, not much precipitation, so paying attention to the wetness of the track there. Uh, I like a horse number three, Max Player. Uh, by honor code, it won, uh, you know, adding the d distance by four links. Uh, both starts at the mile distance, so you got to like that. Linda Rice and Davis, 29% at Aqueduct on 38 yeah. mounts. Uh, nine to two yep. there. Uh, I think the race is open, but that would be my top choice. Number eight, Portos, uh, Todd Pletcher. This horse, you know, win by 10 at Aqueduct. Nice speed figure. Uh -huh. uh, tap it Colt, so that might be one to pay attention. Van Z at eight to one, I thought, had a shot, one, uh, two out of its last three. Uh, including last on synthetic. This should be the front speed, 8-1 to one there. And then Shotsky, you, yep. you talked about a little bit. This horse won the grade 2 Remsen. It's got a January birthday, something to pay attention when looking at the three-year-olds. Uh, what is, do you mean? Well, I mean, it's just a, a little bit more developed and older. Older. Uh, so when you're looking at a horse that has a January birthday or mm -hmm. February birthday. Couple months. Compared to April or yeah. Uh, some that are farther, that's that's a big difference in these younger horses. Yep. Uh, number six, Prince of Pharaohs would be another one also. Maybe throw in there eight to one. But I think this race is wide open. Top choice is going to be number three, Max Player. But I like the Withers. I think it's a, a race to see who could win. I, I don't see uh, five Shotsky as a, a dominant favor. Right. It can win the race. But it's going to be a good one when you're talking about three-year-olds, yep. Felix. Your top, your top selection, what's the morning line? Nine to two. Nice. Who rides? Uh, Davis. And uh, 29% with uh, Linda Rice. Linda Rice is having a nice little meet going right now. Yes, uh, she she's is. hot right now, so you yes. ride the hot trainers. Yeah, and she likes to go to her her go-to guy without any question. Uh, besides Alex Solis. That was a joke. Most people won't understand that, but maybe Zapper will. But uh, Linda Rice, Dylan Davis, very, very, very prominent. But Zapper, uh, Linda Rice has another runner in here written by Kendrick Kamush. Uh, you know, we always say when a trainer has two, you always go for the higher price. But give us your take in regard to the Withers. I think Tommy D covered it well. This race, uh, Shotsky, you know, is uh, the name horse because he won the Remsen, but he did it with a very easy lead. And any time a horse does that, I, you know, try to beat him. Uh, and if he wins, he wins at low odds. The horse that I find interesting, and Tommy D did not mention him, is the two horse. Uh, you know, with the Super Bowl coming up tomorrow, we got a horse here named Monday Morning QB. And uh, he's by Imagining, who's the son of Giants Causeway. He has, um, you know, he's been running at Parks and then Laurel, but he just won, uh, I think it's called the Hep Stakes, 100 grand and going 7-8. And I thought he was cruising in that race. And I think he can stand the mile and an eighth here. And, uh, it's, you know, he's got a little speed on the bottom side with not for love. But I like uh, I like the Giants' Causeway line. And, you know, if I'm going to bet the race, this is owned by the Cash is King folks. And uh, they've always been around good horses, including uh, a Fleet Alex back in the day. Robert Reed's the trainer. Um this is a moderate $25,000 purchase. He's 4-1 to one on the line. I think he'll go up higher because he might not get the respect he deserves. But for me, Monday morning QB. Call it a hunch play if you want, but watch out for this guy because I think he's the real deal, and I think he's going to stand the raise in class and also the distance. So Monday morning QB gets my top billing, Felix. All righty. So um, a good group of three-year-olds in the Withers. Zapper? Uh, you know, let's face it, Independence Hall crushed the last two races in New York. Um, he goes to Florida uh, for some sunshine and warmer weather. Shotsky uh, got everything. You know, it's interesting because the horse that most people believe will challenge Independence Hall 
there's this Aja Weed who was second to Shotsky, arguably the better horse in the race. And the reason that's kind of close to home for me is we're running our filly uh, in the Baltus Barn next weekend in the Las Virginis, and that's Venetian Harbor. And we lose Joel Rosario, uh, and we get Pratt back because he's going to ride Aja Weed. So Shotsky beats Aja Weed with an easy pace. He's the proven horse. Everybody else in this race is just trying. They're all eligible pretty much for the first allowance condition, Phyllis, except the one I mentioned who just won his second in a row, Monday morning quarterback. So I think it's a contentious race, like Tommy D said, but uh, I guess we'll know after they run it because right now these horses are just trying to get on a list and go on to the next big race. Uh, probably in New York, uh, you know, you lose some good horses to the warmer weather states in Florida and uh, even fairgrounds, et cetera. But I think it'll be a fun gambling race, and that's what the fans like to see. And yeah, Tommy D brought it to us, a gambling race, because he has four or five horses that, you know, that he mentioned in here. When I asked him what type of, uh, when I asked you, Zapper, what type of uh, group this was, three-year-old group, uh, he, he used this Italian sign sign language hands, meaning that it was a a so-so group. But uh, that opens it up if there's no strong standout uh, for a price. Let's head down south. Let's go down to the the Holy Bull. And I'll toss you, Zapper, you see anything in Florida in the Holy Bull? I think there's seven going to post here. What do you think in regard to this race? Well, I mean, what we have here is uh, number three, Tis the Law, three to five, Felix, uh, he was the one horse that had a chance to take the two-year-old crown away from Storm the Court and did not do it. Uh, he kind of had a rough trip inside that day at Churchill in the slot. I mean, he lays over this field, uh, really does. This is a mile and a 16th, and he lays over this field in experience and basically in what he's done. I mean, most people are going to look at him and the one-horse Toledo here, who's the second choice. He was the second to Ete Indian, and, you know, a lot of people say, well, maybe that wasn't a fluke. Son of Summer Front and Patrick Van Cohn, uh, this guy has got more lives. He's, like, has a huge resurgence going on this winter in South Florida. And Van Cohn's got Ete Indian. I think it's those three horses, the 3 one, four. I think I, if I'm playing through the race, I just got to use all three, and I would love to beat his the law because he's 3-5 to five on the morning line. Tommy D? Yeah, Zap, uh, I don't love this race either, but Tis the Law, as you said, looks to be the horse to be here. Morning line, three to five. Uh, this horse finished in third at, uh, in the grade two at Churchill last time off the bench, so should expect a, a bigger run. Been off since November. The other one that maybe caught my eye a little bit is number six, Relentless Dancer. Uh, maker gets Ortiz aboard. Hasn't ran since October, but both the races... Uh, against a little bit softer, but one by 10 and one by nine. So saying that, Ortiz gets the call. I like the combo there. Maybe an outside shot on number six, Relentless Dancer, to show up in the mix. But I think you're right, three, Tis the Law is going to be. And that four, uh, Ete Indian, you know, big race last time, you know, going from the turf to the dirt. So, you know, showing that speed figure at 86 maybe prefers the dirt more. So uh, I like the three, six, and four here in this, uh, the Gulf Stream. What, what's Holy the name Bowl. of the horses? Uh, I like number six, Rel- Rel- Relentless Dancer. Mm-hmm. Who trains? Tis the Law. Relentless Dancer is uh, trained by Michael Maker. Uh-huh. Ortiz is getting the call. Uh-huh. Number three, Tis the Law. Uh, uh, tag Barclay. Manny, Barclay Tag. Yep, yep. Manny Franco is going to yeah, be. Yeah, that's a Barclay Tag's back into the mix. Remember Funny Side, Tommy D. He trained Funny Side. Who won the Kentucky Derby? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, it's been a while, but yeah. yeah. It has been a while. He was the gelding, right, Zapper? For these owners, the Sacatoga boys, yes. uh, high school buddies who took the bus to Churchill Downs and uh, took the prize and tried to go for the Triple Crown. And uh, if you recall, it was a horse named Empire Maker who we lost recently who took him down in the Belmont Stakes. And what about um, Pioneer of the Nile? Uh, let's pay homage to Pioneer of the Now, losing him just recently, I believe, at the age of, am I going to say 24? Is that correct, Zapper? Ooh, that's a good one, Felix. I'm not, we'll have to double, we'll have to verify and double check that. But Pioneer of the Nile, you know, besides being a pretty top three year old, and I think he won the San Diego Derby, but what I think he'll go down in history as is the sire of the Triple Crown winner, American Pharaoh. 
What'd you say? <laughs> uh, Pioneer of the Nile is American Pharaoh's sire. Yes. And I think he'll go down in history as that'll be his number one. I think that'd be the, the top line. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, that he sired uh, a Triple Crown winner. Yep. He's been a very solid sire in his career. He was a very solid racehorse. And uh, basically, uh, you know, he'll be missed. They're always missed, but he leaves his legacy because with Bloodstock, we, he sired many crops of horses, and obviously American Feral was leading first crop sire. We're seeing these American Ferals kind of act on both surfaces, dirt and turf, and that's kind of what Pioneer of the Nile was, you know, when you had... Uh, the pedigree expert uh, a few weeks ago, she talked about them not liking turf too much, but yet American Pharaoh, through the bottom side, possibly carries on a good turf pedigree and a good turf. Uh, he's, he's, he's stamping turf horses more than even dirt horses. We'll find out today. Pete Erden's got Royal Act and the uh, Robert Lewis. So there are a couple American Pharaohs trying to get on the Triple Crown trail today. All right. Uh, Pioneer of the Now was just 13 years old. Uh, he was uh, sired. And born in uh, 2006, and he died last year, uh, March 18th. I thought it was sooner than that. Did Empire Maker just pass away? Yes, he just passed away, Felix, uh, in the last week or two. All right. I was, you know, he went to Japan for a few years, came back here, and, uh, you know, basically has a couple of new American crops. And then we lost them. You always think you lose them too soon, even if they're 20. I mean, Empire Maker, obviously, was Bobby Frankel's best shot to win a uh, Triple Crown race and did so in the Belmont Stakes. Right. And do we know who, the trivia question, do we know who beat Pioneer of the Now in the Kentucky Derby? Uh, you know, that that's a good one. Wasn't that the Miss? When Dirk and Miss mine that bird scooting up the rail? That's exactly right. Mine that bird. Got the job done in the Kentucky Derby, beating and edging uh, Pioneer of the Now. Let's go west here. The Robert B. Lewis as we talk thousand words. Is this the real deal, thousand words, Tommy D.? You know what? If there's any horse today that might be the real deal, this might be the one, Felix. Uh, I have to see a little bit more out of this horse uh, but, you know, this might be the top horse to keep your eye on today if you're looking for a derby horse. You know, a $1 million purchase, Pioneer of the Nile, as we said, two for two. The speed figures look good. You got Bob Baffert, obviously phenomenal with, with the young horses. Pratt Combo, they got 40% on 10 starts together. Also, January birthday there, number 2,000 words uh, in the Robert B. Lewis. This might be our best chance of a derby horse running today, Felix. Yeah, I think you're right. What do you think, Sapper? I think he got the right par in Bob Baffert, but he might have the wrong horse. And the reason I say that is high velocity got very uh, he got very nervous and wet when he met up with Thousand Words after winning the Bob Hope at Del Mar and looking like he'd be any kind of horse. I didn't think he was at his very best, and the pace was rather swift, and he was on the pace. And he is, of the two horses, uh, since that race, no doubt in my mind, high velocity, and you might want to check with Toby Terrell, high velocity has trained better of the two than 1,000 words. So he, we might have a, a Baffert horse going on the serious trail here, but it might be the five-horse high velocity. He's by quality road out of a Dixie Union there, so he's got the pedigree. And I mentioned my buddy Pete Irvin's horse, Royal Axe. This horse has only run on turf twice, but he acts like he handles the dirt quite well in the mornings, and it'll be real interesting to see if he can transfer it. And Mr. Mandela, who obviously lost Omaha Beach right before the uh, big race at the Pegasus, he's got another good young colt. I saw him in school yesterday, big strapping colt, and that's the three, Tis the Magician. He broke through on his uh, sixth race last time after four seconds, kind of reminding me of Omaha Beach, who did took a while to break his maiden. So maybe Mandela... Uh, after today, we'll be back on that Triple Crown Trail. Real interesting race, Felix. Yeah, I like uh, the Robert B. Lewis here. I think it looks good. High velocity. You know, this horse, you know, Rosario getting the call for Baffert Quality Road, as we know. Uh, and it's funny, I was going to ask you about Royal Act, and you answered my question there uh, already. Um, but let's uh, move along to the next race here. Um, the, do you have any opinion in the swale, actually, over at uh, 
at Gulfstream that's a, a grade three going seven furlongs. Uh, do you have any opinion in that race, up? Well, you know, you know the truth of it all is that I always have an opinion, and that's uh, I just got to jump to it, and I just did. There's an interesting horse. Uh, this could, this is the most interesting three year old of the day, Tommy D. Untitled uh, breaks his maiden by eleven. He's the son of Kozan, who actually uh, had a limited career as a horse, He's, uh, as a as a race horse. He only ran three or four times. He's done really well in South Florida, in well, in Ocala, Florida, uh, in his first crop of horses. After this horse won for Ralph Nix, they. It's funny because they literally put it out there. This horse, Ralph Nix basically said, this horse is for sale, and the highest bidder would probably get him. And here here we see Gary Barber and partners, and they obviously have a lot of money. And this horse was put on the market, and he got, he got grabbed quickly. Mark Cassie, in quotes, has said this horse has done everything asked of him. Is he a classic bred horse? I don't think so. Elusive quality mare by Kozan, who's by distorted humor. He looks more like a middle distance, but this race is seven eighths of a mile. This horse got a big speed number on anybody, whichever speed number, rag, thoroughgraph. We know we got a 98 buyer. If we look at the racing form, Cassie loves what he's seen so far. He, he starts at seven eighths, which a lot of good horses have uh, started this real uh Campaign seven eight Seattle Slew unbridled Nyquist a lot of a lot of horses went on for D- Derby Kentucky Derby and Triple Crown Glory so I'm just real interested he's got to beat the four horse Greenlight Greenlight Go who had one misstep as a two year old comes back for Jen, James Jerkins could be an interesting race I really see these two dominating but I'm real excited to see the two horse untitled to see how good is he against winners. Hey, I don't know very much about anything here. Felix Taverna along with Way Taylor producing our show live from the WS radio network, along with Tommy D alongside in the studio. Uh, Larry Zapp is at Santa Anita. Uh, I'll give you guys an eclipse awards for the analysis that you just broke down on the withers, uh, the Holy bowl, the swell, uh, the Robert B Lewis here at, at Santa Anita and uh, the analysis has just been tremendous for anybody listening. I'm getting a lot of texts. We're getting a lot of response from uh, this morning's show live from Southern California. I wanted to ask a question to Larry Zapp quickly. Zapper, have you ever trained a Kentucky Derby winner? Never trained one. I had a horse I purchased named Dance with Fate have a rough trip sixth in the Derby, and he was a better horse than California Chrome. And I can't prove that because he had a fatal accident. Okay, so the question Mark. is: the question is, have you ever trained a Kentucky Derby winner? Uh, not yet. Okay, we got the we got somebody who has trained a Kentucky Derby winner, and he's joining us. One of our favorites on this show. Uh, one of my personal favorites, because every time we reach out to him, he always makes time for us here at Track Talk in Southern California. He might be at Gulfstream Park. He might be down at the fairgrounds. You can find him almost anywhere where there's a big race. He's trainer Graham Motion. He's joining us on Track Talk on this Saturday, Saturday morning. Graham, thank you very much. How are you? Hey, good, good to be talking to you. Good morning. Good morning to you. Where are you? Are you at Gulfstream Park? I just left the training center at Palm Meadows, which is about 45 minutes north of Gulf Stream. Nice, nice. What do you think about uh, the Holy Bull and the Swell today? Has anything caught your eye that, uh, as a trainer, uh, uh, you were a uh, wow about? You know, it's interesting. I just heard you talking about the Swell. We actually made a bid to try and buy that colt as well. So it would be very interesting to see how he runs. And, you know, I'll be rooting for Barkley Tag. He's a guy um, who I've been stapled with when I first started training in Maryland, so I, I, I've always been good friends with him and follow his horses, so I'll be rooting for him in the Holy Bull. When you look at the group of three-year-olds this year, Graham, uh, Animal Kingdom is uh, your claim to fame. You got them to the winner's circle to win the Kentucky Derby, you and Barry Irwin, and um, it, it seems like yesterday. Um Tell us what you've seen from the three-year-old crop down in Florida. Uh, have there been any standouts like an always dreaming or uh, a constitution? Is there somebody that's been a standout that you say, hey, look, 
I can't wait to see this Colt race again because I know he'll improve and step up. And, and more so, what kind of group is this three-year-old? I think the jury's out. I'm probably a little removed from it, to be honest, because I haven't really had a, a horse competing in that division yet. So, um, you know, I, I'll be very intrigued to see how Barkley's horse runs today. I think it was intriguing that he skipped the Breeders' Cup. Um, you know, I'm sure he was thinking ahead to this year, and that was part of the reason he did it. And I, you know, I admire him greatly as a horseman. So I'm always curious to see, you know, talented horsemen like Barkley and, and how things plan out with their horses, um, especially good horses like this. So, um, you know, I'll be watching Tis the Law this afternoon. I'm excited to see it. But beyond that, I don't have a great deal of knowledge about the rest of the, the division. I mean, everybody's inclined to say it looks like a, an average division until a horse sort of steps out and, and really shows his mettle. So I think the jury's out. Uh, you kind of surprised me with that comment in regard. You said you haven't been in that division. You're a former Kentucky Derby winner. And, uh, you know, you see Baffert have four, five, three-year-old contenders, maybe a little bit more. You see a number of the trainers have a few horses. How difficult is it to have a horse to get ready for the Kentucky Derby and prep them through uh, the prep races leading to the first Saturday in May and beyond? Look, it's incredibly difficult. And, I mean, the, the, what's really difficult is to have, first of all, you have to have a good three-year-old, and then you've got to have them come to their very best healthy on the first Saturday in May. And, and that's a tough thing to do, and there's certainly some luck involved because, um, it's, it's a tough road to get there. So, uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something you take lightly. And I, I hope to be involved with it every year, but right now we're not, we're looking for a cult, but, uh, right now we're not really in that very strong in that division, but we have a nice three-year-old filly. So I'm excited about her. All right. A three-year-old filly. We're always open for ears. What's her name? Well, her name's Sharing. She won the Breeders' Cup, for uh, juvenile fillies on the turf. Yes. So she's a filly that's probably about a month away from. Her first start this year, so we'll be happy to be uh, competing in the in the Philly division this spring. Well, you have three Breeder Cup wins to your credit. 2004, you won the Breeders' Cup Turf, the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf in 2010, and of course, uh, last year, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf in 2019. You also have, as mentioned, a Kentucky uh, Derby win to your resume and the Big Sport of Turfdom Award in 2011. Tommy D, for our good friend, Graham Motion, who uh, we follow quite closely here on the West Coast, he just shared that he doesn't have any big, big guns in the holster uh, this year, but uh, maybe on the female side, you never know. you always got to keep an eye open for Graham Motion. Yeah, Graham, thanks for joining us. I have a question about actually another filly winning a grade three last time, 105 buyer grade three stakes at Gulfstream, and that's Mean Mary, uh, filly, you know, by Scat Daddy. Uh, could you tell us how this horse uh, came out of the last race and maybe the plans, uh, how, how she's looking, and, and maybe your next move for this uh Horse mean Mary. Yeah, I actually watched her train this morning. I think she looks great. I'm, I'm inclined to go easy on her for the next month or so, and maybe point to the the, the bigger races for these fillies are in the summer, and I would definitely like to have her around for the Breeders' Cup. And I, I feel pretty strongly that in order to get there, you've got to have a relatively fresh horse in the fall. So I think we'll plot a campaign here for her now, and you probably won't see her much before Keeneland, maybe even Belmont in May. Let me go to Zapper. Zapper for Graham Motion. Tommy D is firing away. He's looking down for his next possible question to Graham Motion. What about you, Zapper? Well, Graham, you know, this has been a uh, really tough week, you know, in Southern California. I mean, you have a daughter, Jane, and she's uh, she, a lot of people know her in racing. So she's good for the sport. She gets young people involved. So you must have felt the Kobe Bryant thing, but Talk about your daughter's involvement and your how proud you must be as a dad. Yeah, look, I, uh, I, my, neither one of my kids are overly involved in racing, but my daughter has, you know, been involved through social media, and uh, you know, like like any of us, she loves to be around on the big days. So um, I feel very fortunate that she's gotten to grow up with racing. Obviously, she was there when we won the Derby, and I think, you know all those big victories that we had are things she'll never forget. Um, and I, I feel very fortunate that she's been able to share that with me. You know, she also was with me uh, 
in Dubai when we won the World Cup, which is a day I'll, I'll never forget. So, look, I, I feel very lucky to pass on those memories to her. And, you know, like you say, the, the sadness of the Kobe Bryant situation and, and just, you know, very much like, you know, basketball and horse racing, we, we have heroes that we follow out there. And, and that's what makes these days so special. And it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to share that with somebody. Tommy D, a follow-up for Graham Motion. Yeah, Graham, I just got to ask you about the, you have two runners today, one at Laurel and one at Tampa Bay. Uh, Could you give us your thoughts on these horses? One's Windy Lane in race six, and then Captain Hardship in race eight at Tampa Bay. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to help you much because I had to scratch both of them. They they got very, it got very wet at Tampa. They had a lot of rain, um, so I ended up scratching Captain Hardship, and I had an issue with the filly at Laurel that we had to skip today, so... I'm afraid we're going to be very quiet today, which is disappointing. You want to be busy. You like to be busy on Saturdays, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, all right, we'll ask you one final question. This is Felix once again. Who do you like in tomorrow's Super Bowl? Well, I'm rooting for the Chiefs. I got to meet Andy Reid and, and the manager, Brett Beach. Um, actually, when we won the Derby with Animal Kingdom, they came out to Fairhill one morning and watched them train, and I've always sort of kept, up, kept in touch with them. So uh, I'll be rooting hard for the Chiefs. Did Andy Reid say what position Animal Kingdom would play if he played on his football team? <laughs> That's a good point. No, but he was uh, he really enjoyed the morning. Um, you know, he was fascinated at the similarities to the way we we treat the horses similar to the players with the uh, you know, the ice baths and and things like that. So, look, I think he's a guy I I'm probably talking to the wrong crowd with you guys being in California because I'm sure you're all 49ers fans. But no, no, not really. Like... No, not really. My man <laughs> my man Tommy across the across the way here has been on the Chiefs, and he's a Chief Eagle. That's his nickname, Chief Eagle. So his team got, you know, he liked the Chiefs and the Eagles for the last couple of years, and he, he got purple on me this year. He threw the Ravens in when I told him that they weren't very good. They were the, the worst 13-3 and three team I've ever seen. But, hey, Graham, this is not the day to, to have you and talk about this but I do want to have you come back on and respond to the letter that you penned after the Breeders' Cup here in Southern California because I think it went underneath the radar. It was so well written by you and from somebody inside the industry to paint a picture of what really was and what really is, I wanted to go ahead and expose it. But uh, today is not the day. I'd like to have you come back on. Enjoy your Saturday. Enjoy your Sunday Super Bowl, and we'll check in with you down the road. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you guys for having me. All right. Thanks. Graham Motion joining us live from, uh, where is he live from? Zapper in, uh, in Florida, the workout center. What's it called? Tommy? No, he's at, he's at Fair Hill in Maryland. This uh, is, is that what he said? He was at Fair Hill. Oh, I thought I he think- said, I thought he was, what's the other one called down in Gulfstream? Palmdale? Palm Meadows. Palm Meadows. Okay. There you go. I thought, but he normally trains at Fair Hill and that's the place where you can like in the, during the spring, summer months, you can train out of Fair Hill and ship to about eight different racetracks. It's, it's paradise for horses. You get to turn them out every day. They've got grass. They've got everything. We all wish we had that. We wish we had that. San Luis Rey by, would be the closest thing. Southern California is something yeah, like that's that. That's where Michael Maker and all those guys really uh, getting their horses ready, Fair Hill. And uh, we've had them both on talking about that. Last Saturday inside this studio, Uh, just prior to going on air, um, it was funny because I sat on the left side and Tommy D was on the right side. And for all the shows we've ever done, Tommy D has always been to my left. But for some reason, I looked outside to the Air Force Base, the Naval Air Force Station here, and it was extremely foggy. And I was looking at the landing spot and I was sharing with Tommy D. I said, boy, I said, you know, nobody's going up today. This is very, very foggy. And uh, we didn't see the fog like this. And then Sunday we did not do a broadcast. And then we learned about the crash that took place up there nearby Calabasas where Kobe Bryant and the other uh, eight were killed and perished in that helicopter flight. And all week long it's just been just so much of a, 
I don't know. It's been just a disturbing emotion. It just lingers on with you, and you think about it, and one story comes to, you know, down the pike, and another one follows it where that we learned that his daughter Gianna was on the plane, and she had two teammates on the helicopter, I should say, and it was very, very unfortunate. Uh, 1981, I worked for the San Diego Clippers, and uh, Joe Jellybean Bryant was traded from the Philadelphia 76ers to the San Diego Clippers. And by the time he got here, uh, I got ingrained and entrenched with the friendship of another Philadelphia guy named Michael Brooks, who came out of LaSalle and was the first round draft choice of the Clippers. And we became very, very good friends. And that's where I met Joe and Pam, uh, Kobe's mother and father. At a party in La Jolla one night, I was able to hold Kobe Bryant as a three-year-old, not knowing what a great star he was. Tommy D., you're a parent. Uh, you're going to be soon a parent of a, a baby girl, and uh, you have a son. Uh, just the Kobe Bryant crash was huge in its own right. But for his daughter to be on that plane and two other teammates as a parent, it must affect you as well. Oh, yeah. There's no way you cannot uh, have uh, some kind of pain there for the families. You know, being a father, you know, that means everything to your child. Uh, you know, for me speaking and, you know, to have a tragedy like that, Kobe Bryant being a big name, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, you just got to remember to love your family, love your friends and everybody around you, because at, at any moment things could be taken away. And this just shows you how uh, fragile life could be. And I think that, you know, as a parent, you know, that's like your worst nightmare, uh, you know, is having your child, you know, pass away before you. So, you know, my heart goes out to all the people in the crash, uh, the family members, everybody. Uh, I think the Lakers did a nice job with a uh, tribute last night. I was able to watch the game. I would have liked to have seen the Lakers win the game. Uh, Damon Lillard really put a, oh, a cap on that. But Boy, uh, is he beautiful or what? Man, but it was great. LeBron had a nice speech, and, and I thought they did a great thing. Um, but it just shows you that, you know, life is uh, fragile, and you got to enjoy every moment and love each other. So, uh, you know, and definitely love your kids and, and tell them you love them. The head of the Staples Center, Wade Taylor. The head of the Staples Center in Los Angeles last night released a statement stating that if you didn't have a ticket for the game, please don't come down to uh, Los Angeles Live, L.A. Live in downtown L.A. where ESPN is located. And they have this entertainment little village around the Staples Center where all the restaurants and the pubs and what have you. Just very, very exciting. One million people showed up last night. They, they didn't show the service on the big jumbo screens outside because they wanted people to stay away from that area because all week long the memorials of people coming down there, they said they've never seen anything like it. They said it's almost on the, uh, on the, uh, the same vein as the princess, Princess Diana in England. Uh, when she lost her life and that it was just a national and international memorial where everybody around the world uh, sent out their condolences and their, and their sympathies. Um, it affects you so many different ways. Uh, you know, I've been a big Laker fan, and um, I can remember sitting with Jerry Tarkanian, and Tark loved Kobe Bryant. I mean, Tark was a Kobe Bryant A1 fan. Zapper, what do you remember of Kobe Bryant? Well, you know, I remember watching some footage on ESPN when he was going to be drafted and going, and then when Jerry West made the trade for him, going, man, that Jerry West, not only the logo, and, you know, there's a big push to make uh, Kobe the next logo, which won't shock me if it happens, but... Well, you know, he talks about he reinvented his mentality about called it Mamba, called himself uh, Black Mamba. But the Mamba mentality, I think that's what made Jerry Tarkanian love him, made you love him, made me love him. Even if I, I'm not a Laker fan, Phil, if I'm a Knicks fan, and I've had a hard time rooting for any Los Angeles team, and I've lived here since 84. It's just it's my New York makeup. But the truth of the matter is, how can you not? root for a guy like Kobe Bryant, who just had a determination. Just, I mean, Magic Johnson was something, but Kobe Bryant just, 
I mean, I love that. I can't remember the name of the book, but there was a there was a passage in this book about taking your whatever you do in life to the next level, and it talked about Kobe Bryant calling up the team of Lajuan and ended up flying to Houston and trying to learn that shake that he every year. I mean, he learned the sky hook of Kareem. He learned the baby hook of Magic. He just had a determination and a work ethic that we all can learn from. And I think that's why he's in, he's inspired so many people to reach out to the, uh, you know, want to, you know, go down to the Staples Center there and just have a, and feel a piece of this because basically what he did for all of us is, make us all more determined in life to succeed at something and be good at something. And what he did post-career in those couple short years, you know, talking about his love for basketball, winning the Academy Award, uh, how he, you know, became his daughter's mentor and do anything for his daughters. And that's why he had the helicopter. But just watching him and his moves. And, you know, he, he emulated Michael Jordan when he needed to. He emulated anything and everybody, but he was his own guy. And, boy, he, he is one of the most inspiring athletes I've ever witnessed. And he's still going to inspire us years to come. So uh, he just did so much for my love of, uh, of fighting for, for us to be better at something and uh, will not be forgotten by many of us. Way Taylor. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in real quick, get your opinion. You know, as, as somebody that uh, re- you know really doesn't follow basketball. Okay. So Kobe was... One of many, you know, basketball players that I'm kind of familiar with, you know, LeBron, right, and so on and so forth. And so I've been a little bit surprised at the size of those crowds and at the outpouring and all of that energy. So I'm wondering what you think his legacy is going to be and where you think this energy might be directed and, you know, what do you think he might hope people would do to carry forward his memory? Oh, that's a tremendous question. And first and foremost, uh, let me say, we were going to be, we're going to have Jerry West on this radio program. It might be a sport kids or it might be a big bet or it might be a track talk, whatever. But I can remember my good friend up in Los Angeles who's best friends with Jerry West. I mean, best friends with Jerry West. And he told me, uh, when I would sit down and talk with him, he told me about the workout that Kobe Bryant gave the Lakers as an 18-year-older, uh, still in high school, when he came to Los Angeles and he worked out. He said, Jerry West came back to him and had lunch with him after that workout and said, I've just seen the best best college or best professional basketball player I've seen come down the pike for a long time. He was 18 years old. He was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets, taken as the 13th pick in the draft. Jerry West made that trade. Now, the legacy of Kobe Bryant. Uh, Kobe Bryant had to grow because there was a lot of dissension on the Los Angeles Lakers when he first came uh, to the team. Uh, He played his entire 20-year career with the Los Angeles Lakers. He won five NBA championships, two with Shaq, and probably if they stay together, they win eight total because they were that that dominant. His legacy was always of uh, being a scorer. Uh, He had 81 against Toronto. His last game as a professional, he had 60 at the Staples Center against Utah. I think his legacy will be this, quite simple. I don't think there's an athlete that had a work ethic like Kobe Bryant. I mean, he would go back and work and work and work. I heard one one of his friends, I think it was Trevor Ariza, or it was Robert Ory talking about how when they first met him, uh, he started to rewind and review videotape of Michael Jordan over and over and over again. He'd watch this move and that move, and he'd, re- he'd review it and rewind it and, and, and play, it, play it again and again. Kobe Bryant had a big love for media. Uh, he produced a documentary called Dear Basketball that won the Academy Award. He's also in his 
sixth season of producing the punies i don't know tommy d if you've ever seen the punies you have a child uh that you know kobe has really delegated a lot of his life to doing a lot of children programming uh dear basketball was like a cartoonish uh documentary dear P- uh, the punies are about a bunch of young kids that are different than everybody but he had a love for animation and I think uh, that's going to be a major part of his legacy. Yeah, I mean, Kobe is a businessman, not only a basketball player and a father, but a great businessman. And, you know, I think it comes down to his work ethic. And if you listen to everybody, he's going to outwork you. Uh, I just heard a quick thing Jay Williams commentator said after they played the Lakers, he went out and, and shot and Kobe was there. And he said, hey, Kobe, what's going on? And he said, why are you here? He's like, well, I don't want anybody to outwork me. And I think that's what Kobe Kobe thought. He He, he had to do the do the time and, and put in put in the time to, to be the best player that he could be. And, and everyone recognized that on and off the court, Felix. Like you said, uh, great father, great businessman, uh, and, and, you know, overall great basketball player, obviously. All righty. You know that I, I didn't want to say this, but I will, because the late Jerry Buss, the owner of the Lakers, was a very good friend of mine that we used to sit next to each other playing poker. And I adore Jerry Buss. And... I got into his head on a number of occasions talking about Kobe, talking about Shaq, talking about his team, talking about Magic, talking about the coaching job, talking about Phil Jackson. And I miss Dr. Buss. You know, Dr. Buss offered Jerry Tarkanian the head job of the Los Angeles Lakers. That was the second time Tark was offered the head coaching job of the Los Angeles Lakers. Very few people will know this, but Tark shared with me that Jack Ken Cook wanted him to leave Las Vegas and come to coach the Los Angeles Lakers. Kobe is, uh, oh, I'll tell you what, Tupac, uh, probably, and Nipsey Russell and those guys, you know, the legacies that they have within the African-American community, this will rocket ship uh, their legacies uh, by remembrance uh, worldwide. He was international star. One athlete came back and said that uh, he just got back from China, and he said, you won't believe how big of an icon Kobe Bryant was in China. Let's go to uh, almost as big as Toby Terrell up at Santa Anita. You know, Toby, <laughs> Toby Terrell's an icon up there. I mean, uh, they have pictures of him on the, on, on the tote board and on the big screens. Toby Terrell joins us here on a Saturday morning. How are you, Double T? Uh, well, Felix, uh, after that introduction, I, I didn't think we could top last week, but somehow you're, uh, you know, all of that experience that you uh, lean back on, you, you pull it off. I mean, I don't think we can ever top that one. Top which one? Oh, that introduction there. Uh, last week it was so uh, hot we burned the wires, the telephone wires. <laughs> but this week, uh, I'm, uh, this week I'm at a loss for words. Uh, that was uh, that was too much. That was though. touching. Yeah, that was. But it's almost 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 uh, uh, surreal to tell you the truth. And uh, you know what I what I think about is that I don't know if you got, got this or not, but last Saturday, Tommy and Dee and I exchanged places, and I was on the left, and I looked outside, and I didn't see the airfare out there, you know, because I can't see it from my vantage point, but in the position that where he's sitting, he looks out there, and the Naval Air Station is right there, and it was extremely foggy, and I, I said something to him before we got on the air. It was like quarter to nine. I said, man, this is pretty foggy out here, and we're driving down to the studio. It was pretty foggy. Well, the conditions for Kobe Bryant were just treacherous on Saturday, as well as Sunday, and today it's a bright day. But, you know, sometimes I believe that the good Lord takes people that can make a statement and make you sort of break down to the core of uh, being able to think about where we are and what track we're off. And, uh, you know, it made a lot of us think. It made me think. It continues. It's been almost a week. It'll be a week tomorrow. It's made me think about a lot of different things that no matter how big you are, no how much money you have, no how much prominence in where you are, it can be taken uh, at, at any given second. What do you think about the racing up at Santa Anita today, Double T? Uh, Felix, we have three very, very nice uh, stake races today uh, here at uh, the Great Race Place. Uh, the three-year-olds will be uh, taking the stage uh, in the uh, Bob Lewis. Uh, Bob Baffert will be looking for a, a phenomenal eighth win uh, in the race. Uh, 
uh, and um, he uh, ha- holds the aces uh, coming in. Uh, his horses will be very, very uh, low prices and heavy favorites, but I believe John Sadler is sitting in the wings uh, calling an audible here with a, with a horse that's really coming in uh, to a peak shape and a peak race. He'll be a gigantic number, uh, and uh, his name is Encoder, uh, the number one horse. It'll be very exciting to watch uh, and see how this race uh, unfolds. The other stake racing, no letdowns. Right next door there in the seventh race, uh, you have a dandy of a turf race. United almost uh, did everything but beat Bricks and Mortar, your horse of the year. Uh, he shows up in here for Mandela. I think Cleopatra Strike uh, is going to run by him uh, in this race for young Phil D'Amato. Uh, and then uh, the uh, the next race, we got a big full field here and a, and a pretty interesting betting race uh, with uh, horses that are really uh, trying to sort themselves out as to where they belong in this handicap division. Uh, I am going to give Roadster one last shot here today. I really believe he is just uh, as fit and ready as a horse can be. Uh, so we'll see if Roadster can pull it off in the uh, third of three very nice stakes races here at Santa Anita. Eclipse Award winning Zapper Terrell DeLorba right here on Track Talk Radio, live from WS Radio. You want to add anything more to it, Tommy D, what uh, Toby Terrell has just brought to the party? Yeah, no, great racing and a nice call last week. Uh, Toby giving out a $12 winner uh, last week to end the day last uh, last Saturday. Was that the Cedillo horse? Uh, I think it was Mullins, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Cedillo yeah, and yeah. Mullins. Yep, yeah, you're right. Yep. The KP so, whatever his name yeah, was. Yeah, paid $12 something, so it, it good, jo- good job, Toby. Race? Did you see the race? The horse in the middle of the stretch just engulfed the whole field. Oh, it yeah. just went away. You know, almost ran away like you used to do, run away on the basketball court. Yeah. You I, still got that move? I still still got a couple moves, but yeah. I'm more of an old – I got the old-time game. Yeah. I, I pick and roll. I yeah. rebound. I box out. But, you know, saying that, race eight, San Pasquale, I kind of like midcourt here a little bit. Uh, Sheris Espinosa, yep. this horse won the Native Dancer, grade three up front, uh, two back. Uh, one for one at the distance, three to one here. But I also like Roadster, seven to two, second in the Malibu last time. Baffert, Rosario. So I think you got good options there. Kig Abner uh, put up a one-on-one figure, and you got Pratt aboard. Might be one to throw in the mix. But, yeah, the San Pasquale race eight looks wide open. Race seven, I do like number four, United. Uh, Cleopatra Strike uh, is another one that caught my eye, and Oscar Dominguez won last time. So. United, is that the horse that ran second in the Breeders' Cup? Uh, that is correct. Yep. Oh, my. Nosed out to oh, bricks oh, and man. mortars at that a big price. I bet 50 to one. Yep. Oh, uh, that was horrible. That did that. If that horse wins on that Saturday, we're still at Santa Anita. We're still in the we're still in the sky boxes, okay? And we're still drinking that champagne that uh, was given to us by all the parties you and I crashed uh, at that Breeders' Cup. I think about that Breeders' Cup. It was it was so much fun, fun being up there. By the way, I want to ask you something, Tommy D. Uh, how's your Syracuse team doing? Yeah, they're actually playing a lot better than I stated uh, uh, probably a month or two ago. But they're really coming around and playing pretty good basketball they're a gutsy team they've got guys on the team they're playing duke today six and a half at home they're getting six and a half it's gonna be tough they don't have strong big guys but they're playing much better than i thought zapper what about your hoosiers we're getting close to march madness we're falling apart felix uh, right before finding out about kobe i was glued to my tv last sunday and we lost a tough one at home against maryland and uh, honestly, we haven't been the same team since. We fell apart against Penn State second half uh, on Thursday. And tonight, this morning, we're losing already by 12 at halftime to Ohio State. So I think Archie Miller's um, squad is falling apart. They're inexperienced. And we're looking more like an NI team than the uh, than a team that's going to go dancing. But I'll, but I'll be rooting. I talked to his father. I talked to Archie's father this week, Dr. John Miller, back in western Pennsylvania. You know, he's my mentor, one of my coaches when I was growing up. And uh, just seems that they cannot win on the road, he has pointed to me, that uh, Indiana University, the Hoosiers just can't. And they won against Penn State, and they were, I mean, uh, you should, their shooting was horrific, and they had a couple players out. They haven't been really healthy uh, the couple players had the flu. and uh, they on the road against Ohio State today? 
Yeah, we are, uh, like I said, we fell apart second half at Penn State, and we're right now, we just scored a three before halftime, it's 31-22. You know, Archie Miller's dad, Coach Kobe, right before he got drafted in the NBA, and I think one of those McDonald All-Star teams, and uh, Archie Miller, after the game that we blew on Sunday, where they made up six or seven points in the last minute on us, he was uh, obviously, you know, he had to deal with that loss, but then he heard about Kobe, and he talked about, you know, he was a player in high school, and he knew Kobe, and his dad coached Kobe. So yep. they, I don't know if you had that conversation, but no, I did it, not. It, it all I, it's great articles online about it. You should look it up and give him another call and ask him to tell you about Kobe. No, I ask him to come on to the radio program tomorrow. We're going to do a Super Bowl show tomorrow, so uh, be ready for that. Uh, big bet at eight, and then track talk at nine. We'll be able to uh, talk about the Super Bowl. You can join us uh, with any any thoughts that you have. Toby Terrell, best bet wherever you might find it today. Well, uh, let's stick with the. Uh, uh, the maiden race. We didn't talk about a maiden race today. So race two, a big gray horse, my happy girl, uh, has all the leg to run right by these horses uh, in race number two. Where are you watching the Super Bowl tomorrow, Double T? Uh, you know, I find it so hard to leave my two side-by-side 60-inch uh, television sets. Uh, and you never know. I can stray around here. It was uh, I had a tradition for almost a decade where I hit Three different bars uh, is right in a row. Uh, but one of them is closed now, so we're down to two. So I don't know, Felix. All right. What about you, Zapper? Are you going to be watching us 60-inch TVs from Toby, or are you going to be around town in Arcadia somewhere? I'm going to go to the races tomorrow, and uh, then I'm going to maybe be around town. But I do want to throw a horse out uh, as a best bet. Michael right. McCarthy in the fifth race, and – you know, he had a slow Del Mar, but he's really picked it up since Del Mar, and he's uh, got a he's got the real deal. It's on the rail with Joel Rosario, six to one on the line. Things have to go right when you're sprinting on the turf, but this this filly is very athletic. I kind of liked her myself at a two year old sale. Her name is Woke Up to Aces. So um, number one, Woke Up to Aces. Guess Rosario, six to one in the morning line. I think that's our best bet. But if you have any ideas for the Super Bowl, Felix, I'm still trying to figure out who's going to win the game. I'm rooting for the Niners, but I'm I think it's going to go either way. I will tell you tomorrow. You're going to join us for our big bet show. I'll do a little more research and uh, bring uh, and try to get Kobe's. Uh, Try to get Miller's dad on because I'd love to hear him talk about Kobe. Uh, I'll get him on. I'll definitely reach out to him and get him on. There's no question. Matter of fact, uh, and if Indiana wins and comes back in the second half, you can be sure. You know, his other son is Sean Miller, who coaches the Arizona Wildcats. And so, uh, Dr. John Miller, I'll reach out to him. I'll guarantee you we'll get him on tomorrow. All right, Tommy D, final word. Where's your best bet, my man? Yeah, I'm in the race one. I'm looking at a different angle. Tajori here, two to one in its last start at the level. Simon Callahan uh, going dirt nice. to turf. Turf sprints, 32%. Yep. And you see Pratt. I got eight to one there. I like the chances there. Uh, you know, to take home the first race at eight to one. All right, nice job. Hey, terrific job from you guys. Toby, Zapper, Tommy D, Wade Taylor, I'm Felix Taverna, thanking Graham Motion for joining us. Thanks for Track Talk. Want to shout out the Mattress Mac out there in Houston, Texas, was run happy in Galleria Furniture. Uh, they're having a big Super Bowl sale down there in the state of Texas. We'll talk with you tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock for Big Bet, 9 o'clock for Track Talk, Super Bowl Sunday. It'll be a gas. Have you tried DRF Formulator PPs at DRF.com? Take your handicapping to the next level with premium features not found in DRF Classic PPs, including one-click access to complete race charts, full-screen video replays with both standard and head-on views, add your notes for a card, horse or trip, and access from any device. View time-form U.S. pace figures, get customized printing options, and so much more. Try DRF Formulator PPs today at DRF.com slash PPs.